to uh, record this because uh, a few people who have sent apologies because it's slightly short notice just after the bank holiday. Um, but we will turn the recording off um, when we do questions so you don't have to uh, worry about those being caught if you don't want them uh, recorded. So let me just share my screen uh, and we will kick off. Okay, um, so the idea is we're going to run one of these uh, every week uh, of the campaign to share some of our latest insights. Some of that will be from our polling. Some of it will be other analysis that we've done. Um, some of it will be comparing uh, historic trends as well, so we can get an idea of where we are and where we might end up. Uh, in this uh, webinar, uh, we're going to very quickly run through the public starting points. Um, have a little bit look at how that translates into voting intention, uh, a bit of a focus on some of the issues that will decide the election, and also the type of voter that we think is going to be most crucial to uh, determining the size of any Labour victory or the scale of any Conservative defeat. Um, a look at Scotland, where we had an opinion poll over the weekend, uh, and of course that will be significant in terms of how easy or not any um, Labour majority or securing a majority becomes. And then a quick run through of what people are telling us in focus groups, which just gives you a little something that you can't get from the data alone. So where do we start uh, with the campaign? Well, uh, we put a poll in the field straight after both leaders made their campaign launch speeches and these word clouds which where we take the words that people use uh, and put them into an image give you a feeling uh, for what people took from those two launch speeches it probably won't surprise you that the biggest word in Rishi Sunak's word cloud was wet uh, given he was uh, being rained upon um, and then there's a mix largely um, of negative sentiment although some smaller words um, the smaller words suggest that one or two people said that so like informative uh, inspiring um, if you've looked at Keir Starmer's, uh, I think he will be quite pleased that change is uh, the biggest word. That's the word that most people gave in response to uh, his speech. But it's not universally positive um, either. You know, you can see uh, rubbish uh, there as well. Uh, boring, uh, usual. Um, so definitely, I think we can say better uh, than Rishi Sunak, and in particular, that change messaging. And I'll show you why that's um, so uh, important. Um, that is because this is a change uh, election. People at this election, when we put a poll out on Thursday, 70% of people said that it was a time for change election. Only 30% said that we should be sticking uh, with the plan. So people are in the mood for change this election. And what you can see from this chart is that when you ask people whether the candidate represents change or represents more of the same, 51% say that Starmer represents change, 49% more of the same. So it's not overwhelming. But I should say when we asked this in January, uh, it was 59% said that Starmer was more of the same and only 41% said that he represented change. So that's actually an improvement for Starmer on change. Rishi Sunak, of course, last autumn tried to position himself as a change candidate, but that doesn't seem to have landed with the public. 81% of the public saying that Rishi Sunak represents more of the same, only 19% saying it represents change. And even amongst Conservative 2019 voters, 57% uh, say that he represents more of the same. So Starmer winning on that change question, which, as I say, is important because people very definitely view this as a change election. And one of the reasons for that is that people don't necessarily think that the country has got better over the past 14 years of Conservative rule. There was that famous Ronald Reagan uh, question, do you feel better off than you did four years ago? We asked the public whether the Conservatives had changed the country for the better or for the worse over the past 14 years that they have been in power. 
53% said that they had changed the country for the worst, just 13% for the better, and 26% were neutral there. I actually think beyond that headline figure, what will worry the Conservatives more here is the fact that those people that voted for them in 2019 Thirty-two percent say change for the worse. Only twenty-six percent say changed for the better. So even amongst those people who backed Boris Johnson in twenty nineteen, slightly more people saying that the country has been changed for the worse. But they don't necessarily think that Labour would be able to do a better job. And I think this is Labour's challenge throughout. Uh, the campaign. I think they have two challenges. One is to flesh out what that change offer is. You can see here that just 32% say they change for the better, 30% think they change for the worse, 22% uh, no difference. Now that's clearly better than the judgment people were making of the Conservatives, but it's not an overwhelming, you know, this is going to be a change government, things can only get better blaring out um on the speakers so part of their challenge in this campaign is what, what will change look like under labor but of course making sure that change isn't too radical such that it scares the horses because the other thing people want is reassurance that whatever happens after the election is going to be less chaotic than the few years that have preceded it one of the things we hear time and time again in focus groups is a real public exhaustion with this sense that we've gone from one thing to the other, from Brexit to the pandemic to cost of living crisis, party gate, the mini budget, all thrown into it. You know, and I think that's why Keir Starmer has used a couple of times in the campaign now that line about a politics which treads a bit more lightly on people's lives. There's also a bit of a challenge for Starmer as well, which um, I will go into in a little bit, in that he remains quite ill-defined in the minds of lots um, of voters. So where does that, that being the setup, the change election, that sense the country has got worse, that question mark over whether Labour can make it better uh, levers? Well, we know that in order to secure a majority at this election, starting with 2019 uh, as the baseline, just to secure a majority of one, the Labour Party would have to be beating uh, Tony Blair's swing in 1997, that historic um, uh, swing that we saw at that election. But we're not in 2019 anymore. And based on the current polls and the current trajectory, it looks like Labour is on course for quite a comfortable majority. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is, quite simply, the extent to which, and you can see this from the first graph, the extent to which they are outperforming the Conservatives based on um, you know, historical context. This is a really sizable uh, lead for the Labour Party, actually currently still just uh, about ahead of uh, where Labour were in 1997. So that's one uh, element, but also another uh, a number of other factors. Um, the electoral geography um, has changed somewhat. So actually, Whilst the Conservatives' gains in uh, the Red Wall helped them uh, to some degree, it also created a huge number of seats with slightly lower majorities. They've also gone through boundaries, which makes Labour's task a little bit uh, easier. And of course, Scotland, which we're going to. If Labour can make gains in Scotland, that makes the task elsewhere easier. Uh, this other chart we put in on uh, the other side of the slide, we put in because there's a lot of talk about what happens if the polls start to narrow uh, during the campaign. And will that be enough to erode Labour's lead? And the interesting thing is in 2017 and 1997, there was... Um, in 1997, there was a narrowing of Labour's lead. You can see that on both graphs. In 2017, of course, uh, Theresa May snap election that went, um, well, certainly not in the way Theresa May would have liked it to have gone, resulted in a hung parliament. So we saw the lead go down. Actually, in other um, elections, the winning party has made gains during the campaign particularly 1992, um, that election, but also in uh, 2015. But what is interesting is that in any of these scenarios, the Labour Party would still enjoy a comfortable lead 
over the Conservatives, even if we see the extent of narrowing that we saw in 2017 when Theresa May almost lost power to Jeremy Corbyn, uh, Labour would still be ahead. So we are genuinely talking about something historic and significant happening during this campaign if um, Labour are to be denied uh, a victory. And so it's quite interesting. In one sense, history is going to be made on either side. Um, you know, if Labour do secure that ma majority from their 2019 starting point, that in of itself quite historic. Similarly, if Labour somehow don't do that, and based on the current polls, it looks like they will do, that would also be uh, historic. It's also worth bearing in mind that when Labour do win power, uh, they've tended to win uh, with fairly sizable majorities because they have come in during those change uh, elections. So you see there that 1997 result, obviously, 2001, 1945. Those are, you know, 1945 and 1997, that real sense that the country was ready uh for change so you know and the really interesting thing that you see is that um in the 2019 vote was really not very um efficient uh for uh labor and they're going to be hoping to make some gains there um the other thing though that i draw your attention to is just how stable the polls have been over the past year you know if you go back to this time last year it's almost as if and you know we know a lot has happened in politics generally um you know been lots of events resignation speeches announcements um but so little of it has had an impact on uh, the polls. You know, there have been times when it looked like it might have been narrowing only for the next poll to see things go in the other direction. Uh, and I think that's really important to bear in mind. You know, I, I am still in the camp where I expect to see some narrowing during this campaign, but it is interesting that to date we have not seen that narrowing. And I wanted to just dig in a little bit to some of the groups who are shaping uh, this election. Some of you will be familiar with more in Commons British Seven segments. Uh, others of you won't be. But just in brief, they are seven groups of the electorate that we have uh, created using people's values, their worldviews. Um, we put that in to an algorithm. And in the UK, it gives these seven different groups. So progressive activists, a really interesting group. They were the group that backed Jeremy Corbyn the most strongly. Uh, they're the only group in the electorate where Labour's share of the vote is down, although I think this could be slightly overstated. They're down from 66% of the vote with progressive activists to 60%. The Greens, the big beneficiaries uh, with that group there. Um, the thing to remember about progressive activists is that very many of them are in places uh, where Labour currently hold the seat quite comfortably. So Labour can actually afford to lose quite a few more progressive activists and it not really threaten their prospects. But then if you look at the other six segments, you see real Labour gains. So civic pragmatists, that soft left group, Labour now comfortably ahead. You know, the Tories now just registering 10% uh, of that group, having been as high as 24% in 2017 and actually higher under Cameron. Disengaged battlers, that um, generally slightly poorer, more economically insecure, urban group, again, Labour having big gains there. And then the two swing groups that we hear a lot uh, said about during the campaign, established liberals, these are sort of Cameronite, blue wall conservatives, Labour now ahead there, although a slightly lower swing. If you look at the decline in the conservative vote, it's certainly there, but it's less steep than some of the other groups, because this group on a personal level tend to quite like Rishi Sunak. And then you see that red wall group. This is the group that in 2017 and 2019 swung dramatically to the Conservatives. Conservatives winning 56% of uh, that group of the electorate in 2019, winning all those seats across the North and Midlands. You look at it now, it hasn't 
quite inverted, but it is certainly uh, flipped. Labour now leading by 22 points um, amongst that group. And you can also see with that Loyal National Red Wall group, that is where Reform UK are performing uh, the best as well. So the Conservatives facing a double whammy of problems with uh, that group. Uh, disengaged traditionalists, a group you might think of as sort of a white van person, um, sort of Tory by inclination if they go out and vote. But again, it's basically tied amongst that group. And I think what will particularly worry the Conservatives and will perhaps shed some light on the announcements we've heard over the past couple of days is that decline in Conservative support amongst backbone Conservatives uh, there, you know, down from 75% to 48% uh, of the vote. Lots of that group currently saying they don't know uh, how they'll vote or they might not vote. And so a lot of what we've seen in the early campaign, an attempt to win those groups um, back as well. How does this election uh, compare to 1997? Because, it, you know, it, it is going to be um, most likely uh, a big change election. Uh, a lot of people saying, well, Keir Starmer's hardly Tony Blair. What is it looking like? Well, the interesting things you see is firstly, how much the 2019 Conservative vote is fragmenting. Uh, it is splitting into lots of different directions, some to Labour, some to Reform UK, some to uh, don't know, with Labour making gains directly from the Conservatives, making gains from non-voters uh, and making some gains from the Liberal Democrats and other parties too. Those Labour gains with uh, non-voters in 2019 might be something it's worth keeping an eye on because it may be that ultimately they don't vote. Some of those will be young people. Uh, some of them will be people who opted out um, of the last election. But you can see they make up a big chunk of the Labour lead. So Labour being able to turn them out will really matter. But looking at that comparison with 1997, you can see actually quite how similar the two elections look in terms of how the Conservatives are holding on to their vote. In 1997, just 58% of Conservatives who backed the party in 1992 stuck with the party. 15% went to Labour, 11% to the Liberal Democrats, some um, went to other parties, there was a referendum party, uh, and some uh, at this point were saying they don't, didn't know how they'd vote or they wouldn't vote. Fast forward to 2024, how were those who voted for Conservatives in our last election, 2019, saying they would vote 54%. So actually, the Conservatives currently on our polling are hanging on to a lower share of Conservatives from 2019 than those in 1992 were kept for the Conservatives in 1997. So it really is quite dire. But interestingly, where they're going is slightly different. So Labour picking up slightly less, actually, than they picked up um, in 1997. But you see that big chunk going to Reform UK and a slightly bigger chunk saying they don't know how they'll vote or won't vote. So, you know, the Conservatives have a challenge on the hand, which I think we're already seeing in uh, this campaign, that they don't just need to win back Labour voters, although it's worth remembering every vote they lose to Labour counts double because it adds to uh, the Labour vote and subtracts from their vote. But they also need to focus on that don't know group who, as I say, looks like lots of them are disgruntled but normally conservatives and those who've gone to reform UK. What about um, making this election uh, a presidential um, election, which has been mooted? Well, it's going to be a challenge uh, for the conservatives uh, to do that on current polling. Uh, Keir Starmer has a lead of 15 points over Rishi Sunak on the question of who would make, uh, who people would most want to be uh, Prime Minister. Um, I put the segments in because there's a lot of talk about um, you know, Keir Starmer not enthusing uh, progressive uh, voters, as I hinted at earlier. But actually, you know, Keir Starmer has a 70 point lead over Rishi Sunak with progressive voters. And what it seems from lots of the data is even those who are slightly unhappy with the leadership want change so badly in this election that they are willing to hold their nose uh, and back Labour, even if they preferred the previous Labour Party uh, leadership. 
might spell problems down the line with the Greens and other parties um, in government. If Labour do come into power, they become a repository for disenchantment. But at the moment, a big lead, Rishi Sunak, only ahead uh, with backbone Conservatives. Uh, and again, a lot of this tied to the Conservative Party's uh, fortunes by a margin of 35 points. People say that the Conservative Party deserves to lose the election Again, only backbone conservatives and then only by a three point margin saying that they deserve to win it. And I think what is interesting is as the election comes into view, we have seen both Keir Starmer and the Labour Party just narrowly tip into positive approval. One of the paradoxes of this election has always been that if Keir Starmer won, he would come into office as the most unpopular leader of the opposition to become prime minister in living memory. You know, traditionally, David Cameron, when he came in, Tony Blair, when he came in, were actually, you know, slightly popular, well, Tony Blair, very popular. Cameron had net positive uh, approval. So it looked like Starmer was going to win, because as you can see from this, much more popular than Rishi Sunak, but uh, with a net negative approval rating. But, and you see the change from the pink dot to the yellow dot on this graph, what we've actually seen is Keir Starmer start to move into uh, positive approval rating, significantly uh, more people starting to agree that he's an asset to the Labour Party. And what we have tended to find is that that is driven by Keir Starmer introducing himself to the electorate. Um, my colleague Ed did a focus group with voters in Portsmouth and Aldershot um, at the end of last week. And what was striking was how little they knew about Keir Starmer. It wasn't positive or negative. It was just not knowing anything. And I think the challenge he has faced is that presented at first impression with Sir Keir Starmer, the former lawyer, that, that isn't a great impression to give to the electorate. You know, people instinctively aren't that keen on lawyers. Um, the Sir title people think, often think is hereditary or it makes him part of the establishment. Uh, and bear in mind, only 11% of people when we polled them knew that Keir Starmer's father uh, was a toolmaker. Most people, uh, when you ask, think he comes from an upper middle class um, background. So this election, an opportunity for him to introduce himself uh, to the public. But in doing so, he also has to convince people that Labour is ready to form a government because people at the moment are basically entirely split um, on that question of way, whether Labour is ready. So he both has to introduce himself and, as I say, flesh out a bit more about what the Labour Party uh, would do. Um, people are increasingly sure um, about who they would vote for um, in uh, the election, but there are still voters to play for, and it's those voters... Um, at the margins who could have a significant impact on the end result, whether it is a Labour landslide, a hung parliament or a surprise Conservative uh, victory. Uh, and those who are undecided still tend to secure um, more Conservative uh, than the electorate as a whole, both in terms of their expressed voting intention when you force them to choose, but also when you look at some of their policy preferences uh, as well. And there is a really interesting group, and we're going to be focusing on this group much more uh, as the election campaign unfolds in future versions of these webinars. We'll be talking about this uh, person uh, more because... When you look at those who voted Conservative in 2019 and now say that they don't know how they will vote, they are overwhelmingly uh, women. So around 70% uh, are women. Um, they tend to be slightly older. So the average age of this group is um, early 60s, so 60, 61, likely to own their own home, not likely to have done... Uh, a university degree. They're from that either that backbone conservative or loyal national, more red wally uh, segment. So they are basically people who would naturally in be voting conservative, but are grumpy with the party, quite disenchanted, disillusioned. This group of Tory 2019 now undecided uh, women will be crucial to the election. 
And as uh, I'm sure you'll all be aware, um, that um, people in sophology uh, like to give uh, a personality or at least a location um, to that key group of voters. So you've heard of uh, Mondeo Man or Worcester Woman uh, as well. Um, yeah, Essex Man, Workington Man in previous elections. We, having looked at the electoral distribution of that type of voter, so women in their 60s, own their own homes, didn't go to university, probably voted leave uh, in 2016, actually cares more about the NHS and the cost of living, which is uh, quite unusual. We have dubbed them uh, Whitby woman. Um, the seat, uh, and you can see the seats where that type of voter is most prevalent um, at the moment. So the new uh, North Northumberland, uh, seat, uh, North Northumberland and Morpeth, I believe it's called, um, but right down to the Isle of Wight as well. And those two types of seats where you wouldn't normally expect Labour to be in with a chance, but actually doing quite well on recent MRPs, either just winning or just behind. But we think Scarborough and Whitby uh, is the sort of seat which typifies uh, where this voter uh, would uh, come from. Scarborough and Whitby is uh, assuming gains in Scotland about the sort of seat which gets Labour to uh, an overall uh, majority. And when we've done focus groups with uh, Whitby Woman, as we are now calling her, uh, we find that they are above all else prioritising stability. They, they are more receptive to the turn the corner message uh, than some other uh, group of voters uh, they like the idea that things basically go a little bit back to normal. Uh, and as you see, I mean, it's, it's striking how concentrated uh, in um, the east of the country uh, that type of voter is in terms of the seats where they are most well represented. Um, I should say, you know, that winning Whitby Woman back wouldn't be enough to keep the Conservatives in office. Um, it would probably, you know, if they won all of uh, Whitby women um, back uh, or a sizable chunk, it would probably, it might lead to a hung parliament. But given we are in the territory where we are, at the moment at least, talking about the scale of a conservative defeat, Whitby woman is far more consequential to that. If Whitby woman ultimately stays at home or votes for Labour, we are very definitely talking about a 1997 style uh, landslide, perhaps uh, even worse. If the Conservatives can win that voter back, then the extent of defeat might be mitigated. And it will come as no surprise, given everything that I've said, that Whitby Woman particularly cares about protecting the triple lock and pension. So that quadruple pension lock was squarely aimed at uh, Whitby Woman, also tend to be more traditional in their outlook, in their values. That national service announcement, you know, there was lots of talk online about the extent to which you know, this was going to alienate young people. If you look at the polling, Conservatives don't have many young people uh, still voting for them, dropping into single figures in some polls. But what it does do is it appeals to this type of voter. So I think what we've seen from those first two policy announcements from the Conservatives is an attempt to shore up this voter who, as I say, if they stay at home um, or vote uh, Labour ultimately would lead to uh, a much more uh, severe uh, defeat. Um, uh, in terms of big issues, uh, I want to quickly touch uh, on that. Um, uh, cost of living remains dominant, although it is at its lowest level uh, for the past couple uh, of years. Um, it'd be interesting to see if that shifts during uh, the campaign. But again, it does show the big headwinds the Conservatives are facing. Supporting uh, the NHS has been second consistently for the past couple of years. Uh, and then you sort of get uh, a bit of a muddle between climate, affordable housing and uh, immigration for the third spot, immigration currently uh, taking that third uh, spaced uh, slot. And this chart is really, um, I think, useful in helping to highlight why Labour are doing so well. So the y-axis shows you, it repeats basically what you just saw. It is how important is that issue to voters? Um, so the higher the dot, uh, the more important that issue is, whereas the x-axis shows you whether they trust Labour 
or the conservatives with that dotted line, the border between the two. And as you can see on every uh, one of the issues, bar the war in Ukraine, uh, I should say the war in Ukraine, important issue for voters. We had some polling out today showing that three quarters of the public think that victory in Ukraine is not just important for Ukraine, but the UK as well, and what is to say the course. But aside from that issue, Labour ahead on all of them, and particularly if you look at where the NHS is, a traditional area of Labour strength, but will be even more important for Labour at this election because it is so much more salient than it has been. Interestingly, though, when we look at Whitby Woman, there is more of a split on um, the issues and who uh, she tends uh, to trust on them. Now, as we said, NH the NHS is high uh, with Whitby Woman. She also cares about immigration um, more, much more than uh, the average voter, cost of living uh, and channel crossings. And as you can see, is actually more likely to trust the Conservatives on uh, lots of these issues. So trust Labour narrowly more on the NHS, on social care, on housing, typically trust the Conservatives more on these issues. And that's what I, why I say, you know, instinctively, she is a Conservative voter, but she is so disillusioned both with the chaos element of things, performance in government, state of the country, that she might opt out because of frustrations uh, on, on these issues. So, and again, you can see why we're going to hear the Conservatives talk, um, you know, a lot about immigration and channel crossings. You'd expect that anyway uh, from uh, the Conservatives, um, but particularly important to uh, that group. Um I should say as well that, you know, there is some debate about the triple lock and do all young people say it's uh, unfair and older people uh, say that, it, that it's not. It's quite interesting when you actually ask um, people about the triple lock, young people are uh, more likely to say it's uh, not generous enough uh, to uh, pensioners uh, than pensioners themselves. Um, it's quite interesting there. We do, the, A lot of the sense of intergenerational fairness tends to come from more highly engaged uh, young people. You see that here when you ask um, about the extent to which government spending is fairly uh, directed or not towards the old and the young. Public are basically split overall. 18% think too much is given to the old, 19% too much to the young. Big chunk don't know or in the middle, but that more engaged group more likely to say that too much is directed at older generations. Uh, and what about those groups who are switching? Um, what are they uh, saying um, about the election and their top uh, issues? Well, again, um, it probably won't surprise you that cost of living is top for um, loyal Conservatives, loyal Labour and Conservative uh, to Labour switchers. But those who have switched uh, from the Conservatives to Labour, slightly more likely to rank the NHS um, higher um, than loyal conservatives rank immigration uh, slightly lower and interestingly rank housing um, slightly uh, higher uh, than uh, loyal conservatives as well, suggesting potentially, and this is something we're going to dig into in some more of our focus groups, that uh, conservative failures uh, or perceived failures uh, to build enough houses or to protect renters might be what has driven uh, some of their voters uh, to uh, the Labour Party. The other thing which is clearly um, driving uh, voters is uh, the extent to which they are financially secure or not. So if you look at uh, Conservative 2019 voters um, and where they are going to, this is a slightly higher figure because we've excluded uh, the don't knows, those who are less comfortable, more likely to have switched not just to um, uh, Labour, uh, but also to reform uh, UK uh, as well. So those for whom the cost of living crisis has really bitten are the group who are most likely uh, to switch. Uh, and again, looking um, at those who, you know, again, you know, this encapsulates Whitby women uh, and other groups uh, as well. well. Why are people saying they wouldn't vote or that they don't know? So those that are saying they wouldn't vote, it is a feeling of being let down or that their views um, aren't being represented in focus groups. We very often 
uh, hear uh, from people this sense that, you know, I was excited when Boris Johnson got in in 2019, there was going to be a new Brexit settlement that we were going to have leveling up, and that hasn't happened. And that disillusionment is meaning some conservatives stay at home. Uh, you also see that with the don't knows, but a bigger chunk of them still saying that they will decide closer to the time or what is happening in manifestos. And of course, we've uh, I've mentioned it a few times, but what about Reform UK? What is driving people to uh, Reform uh, UK? Um, it won't surprise many of you to know that immigration is uh, one of the biggest drivers. In fact, immigration is number one, refugees are number two, uh, dislike of Keir Starmer, number three, uh, along with support for Farage and Reform UK policies on Brexit. But they are way behind uh, immigration. So, you know, m much more so than UKIP even. Reform are a one-issue party. Um, we think that looking at current polling, it does seem like Reform UK have peaked. Um, not standing in the locals uh, or only standing in a few seats does seem to have harmed them. Uh, I think Nigel Farage's decision to opt out will also harm them. And that matters a lot for the Conservatives, because for every 100 votes Reform UK get, they take 60 votes from 2019 Conservatives, just five from 2019 Labour. Effectively, for every 100 votes uh, Reform get, they're making Labour's job 55 votes easier. And if Reform do tick down to five, six, seven uh, eight percent of the vote we're talking 30 to 50 seats uh, that the conservatives hang on to that they otherwise wouldn't have done so again there is going to be that focus uh on reform but brexit looks like it's going to be the sort of dog that didn't bark um during this election having had a 2019 election you know where it was front and center and it's striking that just four percent of those who voted leave say that um brexit will be an issue in impacting their vote 13 percent for remainers which ties with what we generally uh find that remainers are more passionate uh about brexit than leavers are it's a combination i guess of People thinking Brexit hasn't gone that well, and so leavers um, uh, less enthused by it, but also remain having lost, and so yeah, that motivating people more as well. And what do people think will happen after the election? Again, I think this is really interesting, and it gives you a sort of insight into what people are expecting from you know whichever government is formed uh, after so you know it's, it's fair to say broadly people don't expect many uh, improvements on uh, headline issues so we ask people you know under labor will levels of immigration go up or down ditto for the conservative we ask about taxes crime inflation nhs waiting lists i think there are two things that will worry the conservatives here one is that big split on NHS waiting lists. Uh, people are significantly more likely to say they'll go up under the Conservatives and actually to go down under Labour. So there's a 42-point spread uh, between them uh, there. Uh, interestingly, taxes on working people, more people think that taxes will rise on working people under the Conservatives than under Labour. But the Conservatives do uh have an advantage on immigration where more people think immigration uh will rise under labor and that channel crossings uh will rise i just very quickly want to talk about scotland um so we had uh the first uh, uh scotland only poll of the campaign which came out on sunday evening uh, and it found that the Labour Party was five points ahead of the SNP, a 16-point improvement uh, on their 2019 performance, would push them basically close to getting around 30 uh, gains in Scotland, certainly more than uh, 25, uh, allowing them to overtake the SNP as the largest party. And you can see there on the vote uh, shares graph, them gaining from... Uh, the Conservatives and uh, the SNP. Um, what is driving that? Well, I think one of the things that is driving that is that if you look at the top issues, very similar to what you see in the rest of uh, the UK, and only 19% of Scottish voters saying that independence will be an issue that impacts their vote. You know, the pro anti independence split in the poll was fairly consistent uh, with other polls. It was 40 
for 44% against. So the top line figures haven't really shifted. What has shifted is the importance that Scottish voters are placing on independence and on the other issues, whether it's supporting the NHS, cost of living, childcare, you see Labour winning uh, ahead of the S&P, more people trusting Labour. Uh, the S&P does have an advantage on some issues, so narrowly on the environment and immigration, but on those big issues which people are more likely to prioritise the Labour Party ahead. There is some good news for the SNP in that John Swinney is um, the most popular of um, the politicians uh, that uh, we polled and political parties uh, still underwater, but only just minus two um, uh, approval rating. And people are much more likely to say that he is an improvement rather than a downgrade on Hamza Yusuf um, then, you know. Keir Starmer minus 10 in Scotland. I mean, in general, actually, you know, people less popular in Scotland than uh, elsewhere. Uh, it's worth also saying that the time for change mood is just as prevalent uh, in Scotland. And we ask specifically about the general election. We say, is this general election going to be more about sticking with the plan or time for change? It's actually higher uh, than in the rest of the UK, which I think is hurting uh, the SNP. Um, very quickly, because uh, I'm conscious we are um, at time, uh, just some uh, quick uh, quotes from our focus group. Uh, we had four focus groups last week where we spoke to people about their initial reactions to the campaign. You can see some of them there. Um, so this was a group who, who, in a Labour target seat, they had voted Conservative, were now voting uh, Labour. Um, I quite liked Adam's quote. Um, he was comparing, um, you know, uh, Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer to um, football managers. Um, and interestingly, some of the voters not giving the Tories that much credit on uh, inflation uh, because they sort of said, well, you know, isn't that a problem that they created? Haven't they just reversed things which they've done? I went to Aldershot. Um, this is more of a safe conservative uh, seat, but it was interesting that, you know, similar issues coming up, you know, people saying, well, you know, everything is too expensive. Britain, you know, is struggling. But there was a bit more faith um, in the conservatives there. Some people willing, and we find this occasionally, willing to sort of say, well, this is really happening everywhere, uh, isn't it? Um, I won't play this clip, actually, in the interest of time, um, but we'll put it up. Uh, later, uh, and then a group of voters in Portsmouth um, as well, um, where we focus particularly on security. Uh, interesting here that you know they didn't know much about Labour and really, really wanted to know more uh, in uh, the coming weeks. You know they were where they were voting for Starmer. It was because he was the change candidate, but they wanted to know more about what change meant rather than him just being the default. Uh, and then finally, in Bristol Central, uh, which I thought was really uh, interesting, we'll be spending more time there. This is one of, this is probably Green's, you know, top target after Brighton Pavilion that they already hold. Um, it was interesting there. Why were people voting Green? Uh, it was largely driven by um, sort of apathy and cynicism towards politics. It was an anti-politics vote. Um Interestingly, despite the chatter after the local elections, none of the people we spoke to knew the Green Party's position on uh, Gaza. It wasn't really um, about the environment, but more this sense of being able to kind of shake things up and vote for something uh, a little bit different. And it is worth saying that, you know, this isn't something that's just limited to green voters across the board. We hear regularly, you know, this sense that you know, people don't feel represented by the existing parties. They're depressed that, you know, or frustrated, I should say, that Brexit or levelling up haven't lived up to their potential. And so, you know, against the backdrop of change and desire for stability, I think apathy and cynicism are going to be one of the hallmarks um, of this. Um, and there's my colleague, Connors, who we're not going to listen to uh, right now. Um, but again, we'll put that up because um, he is always worth listening to. Uh, I am going to uh, stop uh, there.